Welcome to the U.S. Institute of Peace. We are really delighted to have you all here this morning for what I know is going to be a very convivial conversation about the nexus of civil resistance and democratization. We are also thrilled to be sponsoring the official launch of a brilliant new monograph by Jonathan Pinckney called When Civil Resistance Succeeds, Building Democracy After Popular Uprisings. My name is Maria Steffen. I direct the program on nonviolent action here at the Institute. And thank you. <laughs> That's very kind. Five dollars after the show. Um, I don't know about you all, but authoritarianism and activism have certainly been on my mind lately. Um, so I can't think of a more timely topic uh, to launch a conversation here today. On the one hand, we are living in the most contentious period in human history. There have been more protests and nonviolent campaigns in the first half of this decade compared to the entire decade of the 1990s. So huge amounts of protests happening around the world. At the other hand, as you all know, we are seeing a resurgence of authoritarianism around the world and backsliding in places where we would not have thought to see backsliding in democracies like Poland, Hungary, Venezuela, Turkey. So um, the rise of despotic governance, governance, I think, is one of the really key challenges of our time, and essentially to the work that we do here at the Institute on peace building. Um, it is no surprise that when you look at the top list of most fragile states on the Fragile State Index, those top countries also happen to be the most closed authoritarian countries, uh, according to Freedom House scores. So moving away from authoritarianism um, is really critical to advancing international peace and security. But how that happens, and what happens during the critical transition moment is really, really important. And we're going to hear what the research has to say about that today. I am especially pleased to be co-sponsoring today's event with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, which has been a close partner of the institutes for many years. In some respects, today's gathering is a bit of a family reunion. Hardy Merriman, Machi Barkowski, and I used to be colleagues together at ICNC, and uh, we've collaborated on a number of things, including uh, co-hosting, co-sponsoring the Alliance for Peace Building's working group on nonviolent action and peace building. And Peter Ackerman, who is, was the founder of ICNC, also happens to be the co-chair of our International Advisory Committee here at the Institute, and incidentally was my dissertation advisor. So so I am really pleased uh, to introduce uh, my brother in nonviolent arms and comrade Hardy Merriman to the stage to introduce the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. That was, that was excellent. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to your colleagues at USIP uh, for hosting this event. We're delighted to be partnering with you on it. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Hardy Merriman. I am president of the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, our acronym is ICNC. Um, and a little bit about us. Since 2002, uh, we focused on civil resistance movements around the world, trying to understand why and how civil resistance movements work, and particularly how they can be made more effective. We take a social science approach to this question, uh, looking at why some movements succeed, why others fail, and our emphasis is on strategy trying to understand the strategies of activists and organizers and how that increases the chance of human rights respecting and democratic outcomes. We are thrilled uh, with Jonathan's new research monograph on democratization. Uh, it's, there's been a growing body of research, is this? There's been a growing body of research showing that civil resistance movements generally lead to a high probability of durable democratic gain after transitions. Yet we're also troubled by cases like Egypt and Yemen that did not. So this begs the question of why most transitions do make it to democracy, but some very sharply can fail. So Jonathan has done a great service here by examining this critical question and offering what I think is one of the first cross-cutting frameworks for understanding why and how civil resistance movements succeed or fail in sort of the pre-transition period and post-transition period of bringing democracy and consolidating it. 
this is exactly the kind of research that ICNC loves to support. It's scholarly, but it's also policy relevant and relevant directly to activists and organizers on the ground. As Maria alluded to, it's been documented by Freedom House that for the last 12 years, democracy has been declining. And it's such, it's very suiting to talk today about civil resistance movements, democracy, and my personal interest in how they can help reverse this trend. So thank you again for coming. Uh, please, please pick up a copy. Some of you already have. It's also available for free online to download, so send it to your friends. And now I'd like to introduce Ma Dr. Maciej Barkowski, ICNC's Senior Director for Education and Research, who will introduce Jonathan Pinkney. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, USIP, its president, Nancy Lindborg, and the USIP Director on Nonviolent Action, Maria Stefan, for hosting and organizing this splendid event and with the great participation here in the room, as well as, as, well as many people joining us live on, online. Uh, my name is Maciej Bartkowski. I'm Senior Director for Education and Research at ICNC, and I will be moderating panel discussion after uh, the presentation by Jonathan. And uh, before I introduce the keynote speaker today, I would like to say just a few words about uh, how this event will proceed uh, this morning. Um, so after Jonathan will uh, present, I will ask uh, panelists um, to come to the stage and um, I will then introduce uh, the panelists and each of them will have a few minutes to reflect on the key findings from the monograph and uh, link those findings with the areas of specialization, areas of focus, uh, and discuss a number of um, cases that they are very much familiar with. And afterwards, uh, together with uh, Jonathan, we will um, uh, respond to some of those uh, comments from the panelists, and then I will open the floor for the questions from the audience. Uh, so please make sure to stay with us until uh, the end of this uh, um, panel discussion so you'll have a chance to ask questions and hear others uh, from the audience asking the questions. Um, I was told that we are tweeting um, the hashtag, it's people power for peace. <laughs> All right. So please, uh, while you are listening to the presentation, please also uh, tweet and, uh, and share your thoughts and ideas on uh, what will be uh, discussed here. So I have now a privilege to introduce to you uh, today's speaker, my colleague, Jonathan uh, Pickney. Although he will not admit it because he is a very humble and modest man, but Jonathan is in fact by now a rising star among scholars who are studying civil resistance and nonviolent movements. And he's also a leading scholar on, um, uh, on the role of nonviolent movements in democratization and the impact of nonviolent resistance on democratic consolidation. I have known Jonathan for almost five years. Um, it was uh, our common friend and his mentor, Professor Erika Chenoweth, that um, recommended me to contact Jonathan. Uh, that was um, the fall of 2013, and I had a number of questions uh, about uh, basically the aspects that um, that time Jonathan was working on. Um, the questions were about political transition and the role of civil resistance, and no one had that time answers to those questions that I had. And even Erika Chenoweth, um, the, the prominent scholar of civil resistance, she said, no, I don't know, actually. I have no answers to, to what you're asking. But I know one of my MAs, that time MA students, Jonathan Pickney, who will have the answers to, to the questions you seek. So uh, when I contacted him, I remember he immediately produced all the this interesting and compelling data, and in fact, indeed, he did answer all my questions I had that time. So um, I, was, um, I was also very happy to hear that he um, eventually continued his, his work as a PhD student at the uh, University of Denver, uh, researching long-term long impact of civil resistance movements, and uh, we at ICNC were very happy uh, when he um, also applied for our research fellowship that supported his field research in uh, Zambia, in Brazil, and in Nepal, the case studies that he integrated into his uh, monograph and about which he will talk uh, here as well. And I work with Jonathan as the editor of, of basically his two 
groundbreaking um, monographs that we uh, published uh, in the last three years. The first publication was Making or Breaking Nonviolent Discipline in Civil Resistance Movements. And the second publication that he will be talking about today, uh, civ um, uh, When Civil Resistance uh, Succeeds, Building Democracy After Nonviolent Popular Uprisings. Both of those publications, as Hardy mentioned, they are available uh, for free online for the download. And we've got hard copies available outside of the room that you can pick up uh, as well. Uh, and I must, I must say that as, uh, as the editor, I couldn't imagine uh, a better author to work with than Jonathan. Extremely on time with his draft uh, submissions, never irritated about my frequent edits and frequent requests for more data and additional information. Uh, in fact, Jonathan skillfully masters uh, sophisticated and complex analysis with explanations and conclusions that, that are down to earth, practical, easily accessible and actionable. And actionable means that activists can use Jonathan's findings to increase the odds of the nonviolent struggles against repressive regimes and anti-democratic forces. And this type of work that Jonathan delivers is extremely important for organizations like USIP and like ICNC that work to enhance the skills of those who fight nonviolently for, non for their rights and um, freedoms. So finally, some facts about Jonathan's career. He is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Department of Sociology and Political Science at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He's also an external associate at the Peace Research Institute. Oslo, he supervised data collection, among others, for the nonviolent and violent campaigns and outcomes, NAVCO 3.0, that is hosted by University of Denver. And Jonathan received his PhD in international relations from University of Denver in 2018, and four years earlier, MA degree from the same university. He earned his BA in international affairs from Gordon College in Massachusetts. And he was a recipient of 2012 uh, fellowship from Corbell School, uh, and uh, 2016 recipients of the International, uh, International Center on Nonviolent Conflict PhD Fellowship. He currently lives in uh, Trondheim, Norway, and besides, besides his academic work, he's enjoying road biking, camping, and uh, mountain climbing. <laughs> so Norway is certainly the place where he can really experience those fabulous outdoor activities, and I'm sure I envy you, Jonathan, about that uh, opportunities. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a very well, warm welcome to Dr. Jonathan Pickney, our keynote speaker today. Well, thank you so much for being here today. It's a real privilege to be able to speak here at USIP. Uh, thank you to uh, USIP, to uh, ICNC as well for arranging this event. Uh, and special thanks, of course, uh, to my, uh, my colleagues, Dr. Marcia Barkovsky, Hardy Merriman, Dr. Maria Stefan, um, and uh, Nancy O'Kale and Melinda Herring for being here as well. Um, I want to start what I have to say today with a, a, brief, uh, a brief puzzle to give you a sense of why this topic uh, was of interest to me in the first place. Because this, uh, this really starts with a, a, fairly, a fairly personal story. Um, I, did, I was a, uh, a study abroad student as an undergraduate uh, in Egypt in 2006, and later in 2009 uh, went back to work there briefly. And I remember having conversations with uh, a number of friends who were, act who were sort of political activists of various stripes, uh, talking about what the potential was for political change in Egypt. Uh, and the answer uh, was zero. The answer was none at all. Uh, that the only relevant political question uh, in Egypt at that time was whether uh, when Hosni Mubarak uh, died, uh, whether it was going to be his son who was going to succeed him or whether it was going to be uh, Omar Suleiman, uh, the head of the secret police uh, who succeeded him. Uh, but of course, uh, as we all know, uh, an event which uh, no doubt is deeply familiar to all of the people in this room, of course, in 2011, uh, we had this moment happen. And we have this moment of uh, tremendous hope, tremendous political change, and real optimism uh, across the Middle East that a region that had been previously uh, very, you know, very opposed to democratization, where democracy, many had argued, could never take hold, was now uh, on, the verge, uh, on the verge of taking hold. And this was something that, as a young scholar, I was very, I was very interested in understanding uh, because this was so deeply, so deeply unexpected. Uh, but of course, uh, as we all know, uh, as we all know too well, uh, after this moment uh, came this moment. Uh, 
uh, that over the following years there was increasing frustration and then finally in 2013 the overthrow of Egypt's uh, first democratically elected president and then shortly thereafter the massacre of possibly hundreds, possibly even thousands of peaceful protesters in Cairo's uh, Rabah Adawiya Square. And so I was very motivated to examine this particular question. Why do these nonviolent resistance movements, these nonviolent revolutions, uh, that are these incredible moments of hopeful, peaceful mobilization, sometimes lead to democracy, and why do they sometimes not? And perhaps uh, more importantly, what can we do about it? Uh, there's, of course, uh, an extensive uh, literature on democratization out there that focuses on sort of the deep factors that underlie it, things like the, a country's level of socioeconomic development or its connection to the West, uh, things that if you are in the throes of a political transition, there isn't really much you can do. Uh, but if you, are, uh, if you are an activist, a political leader in these situations, what can we actually say about what is likely uh, to, help you, uh, to help you succeed? And that's really what I'm going to, what I focus on in my research and what I'm going to focus on uh, in the remainder of my, of my time today. Uh, briefly, a couple of definitions just to make sure we're all uh, on the same page. Nonviolent resistance or civil resistance, uh, terms, that I uh, terms that I use interchangeably. Uh, the application of political force outside of the normal avenues of politics and without the use or the threat of physical violence. So three core components there. Uh, action devoted towards political goals, um, extra-institutional or abnormal, uh, and without the use of violence. And next, uh, civil resistance transitions, uh, which I define as political transitions, periods of time between one political regime uh, and another, which are initiated primarily, though perhaps not exclusively, by nonviolent resistance, in which nonviolent resistance has played a crucial role uh, in the breakdown of an old regime. And in fact, civil resistance transitions have been a major force for political change uh, over, over the last 70 years or so in the post-World uh, post War II period. Uh, this map here shows every country uh, that has experienced at least one civil resistance transition uh, during this time. A total of 78 transitions spread across 64 countries. And of these, 70, of these 78 transitions, at least 60 ended in at least a minimal democracy. That is to say, with an effective executive elected in at least moderately clean elections. Uh, which leads me to, sort of, to the first conclusion uh, that I come to in the monograph, and which builds on a growing literature uh, that uh, Maciej and others referred to, uh, that civil resistance does have a strong democratizing impact. Uh, and that this uh, holds up, and this, uh, this democratizing impact holds up uh, even when looking at uh, even when considering the other factors uh, that tend to affect democratic progress. But of course, I wanted to go a, a step beyond that and to understand uh, why some of these transitions end in democracy and some don't. Uh, to do that, uh, I, in part in the monograph and in a larger research project, uh, I do some statistical analysis uh, of this uh, larger population of 78 transitions. Uh, and then uh, in-depth case studies, as uh, Maciej mentioned, of three particular most different transitions, so civil resistance transitions that came about in vastly different circumstances to look for sort of the common threads uh, across, uh, across these cases. Uh, Brazil uh, in 1984, in that country's transition away from military rule. Uh, Zambia in 1991, in that country's transition away from single party authoritarian rule. Uh, and Nepal in 2006, uh, in its transition away from, uh, away from, mo uh, from uh, monarchy. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, uh, the overwhelming finding, first of all, uh, is that civil resistance transitions uh, do uh, tend to be overwhelmingly more democratic than other forms of transition. That nonviolent resistance has this, strong, uh, has this strong democratizing impact. This is even the case in very unfavorable conditions. Uh, the figure here uh, breaks up uh, civil resistance transitions with all other political transitions during this period of time, uh, 1945 through 2011, uh, with the percentage uh, of transitions that ended in, that ended in at least minimal democracy, uh, broken up, again, based on whether they were initiated by nonviolent resistance, and then based on how authoritarian, uh, how repressive the previous regime was. And as you can see, uh, the civil resistance transitions uh, in dark blue there, even in extremely undemocratic settings, uh, the two columns on the, uh, on the far left there, 80% uh, of civil resistance transitions end in at least minimal democracy, 
whereas other forms of transition uh, end in democracy only about 20% of the time. So a strong, a strong, consistent democratizing impact. But then to move on to this question of when we are likely to see civil resistance transitions end in democracy and when not, I focus on what happens after. So once a nonviolent resistance movement has broken down a dictatorship, has ended an authoritarian regime, and initiated a political transition, what are the challenges uh, that arrive afterwards? And in the monograph and in my larger work, I focus on two particular challenges. And it's important to say, I don't consider this to be an exclusive set. These are not the only things that matter uh, in these particular cases. Uh, these are simply two things uh, that we see operating in consistent fashion uh, across wildly, wildly different contexts uh, in civil resistance transitions. The first of these is transitional mobilization. Of course, nonviolent resistance movements uh, tend to involve massive levels of public mobilization, typically across broad sectors of society, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people uh, hitting the streets to achieve political change. But of course, uh, once the uh, non-democratic regime uh, is out, once a period of political transition has ended, we often see very significant, uh, very significant social and political demobilization. Uh, people who have been engaged in politics uh, tend to go home. Uh, there is a drop in public accountability for new political elites, uh, and a new democratic regime is not consolidated. So that's the first challenge, maintaining mobilization uh, to continue to have sources of public pressure during the period of transition. Uh, the next challenge is in many ways the mirror image of the first, uh, and it's what I, uh, what I refer to in the monograph as street radicalism. Uh, where we may have continued social mobilization during the period of transition, uh, but that mobilization is not directed uh, towards building new democratic institutions, uh, but instead uh, is directed towards breaking down any potential system of new institutions and norms as it arises. Uh, that the, the powerful tools of nonviolent resistance and social mobilization uh, are used to prevent the consolidation of any new, uh, of any new political arrangement. Making, uh, making politics uh, perpetually unstable uh, and uh, often leading to a reversion to authoritarianism. And uh, what, what I found uh, in looking at this population of 78 civil resistance transitions uh, in the post-World War II period uh, is that these two factors uh, do consistently predict uh, whether a civil resistance transition will end in democracy. Brief words about this, uh, about this figure here. Uh, this, uh, this figure plots the 78 uh, civil resistance transitions during this period. Uh, on the vertical axis there is the level of mobilization. On the horizontal axis, uh, the level of street radicalism. I won't go into the, the specific statistics of that, but of course happy to answer questions uh, as, people, uh, as people have them later on. Uh, with the democracies indicated uh, in yellow uh, and the non-democracies indicated in dark blue. And as you can see on the figure, the democracies tend to cluster on the top left-hand side of the graph there, indicating high levels of mobilization and low levels of street radicalism, whereas the non-democracies democracies tend to cluster on the bottom right-hand side, uh, indicating low levels of mobilization and high levels of street radicalism. So. Having, uh, having found this uh, consistent relationship, having found that these two challenges do seem to be important factors across this population of cases, I then wanted to examine what are the, what are the lessons uh, that we might take from this, uh, and specifically that people within these countries going through these transitions might take from it on how they can encourage mobilization and how they can discourage street radicalism. And uh, in, the, in the monograph, I, I uh, outline three specific lessons on each, of these, uh, on each of these factors, which I'll briefly walk through here, relating some, uh, relating some vignettes uh, from those three particular cases uh, to illustrate. So the first lesson on maintaining mobilization uh, is to foster independent civic forces. And the crucial thing here is during the transitional period to maintain sources of popular accountability through which uh, issue-based mobilization can be channeled. Uh, so often a, a common factor in these transitions uh, is that you know, forces that have come together to oust a non-democratic regime then rapidly enter politics, uh, either explicitly by becoming political parties uh, or by becoming uh, sort of clients uh, of, uh, of various political forces. 
Uh, and this is, uh, this is important, of course, for, for, some groups, uh, for some groups to do. You can't have a democratic political system without a political competition. Uh, but this often means that there are few voices uh, that remain outside of the political process standing up for the deeper principles of promoting uh, and consolidating democracy. Uh, and indeed, that having such independent voices is often actively discouraged uh, by these uh, new emergent political forces. Um, as one of the leaders of the uh, 2006 revolution in Nepal related to me, we had said our movement will go on until the constitution is framed. And when that happened, our colleagues, political parties, civil society, NGOs deserted us. And slowly, the whole entire civil society forces became status quo oriented. Our wings were clipped. Uh, these independent voices uh, actively demobilized uh, by new political elites uh, and with uh, deleterious effects uh, on the progress of democratization in Nepal. All right. Second lesson on maintaining mobilization. Keeping new leaders accountable. Uh, now, of course, uh, nonviolent resistance movements uh, often, uh, though certainly not always, are led by these charismatic, uh, heroic figures uh, in whom uh, their communities have tremendous faith. You know, people like Nelson Mandela or Mahatma Gandhi come to mind. And there's often, uh, in these cases, a particular faith that once these particular leaders come into power, everything's going to be okay. Uh, Melinda and I were discussing this uh, before, the, uh, before the talk in relation to Ukraine in particular, that this was a, a problem in the, the Orange Revolution there. Um, and the sad truth, of course, uh, is that, uh, as, we, as we all know, uh, power corrupts. Uh, and that the heroic activist uh, who is hitting the streets and willing to go to prison for what uh, he or she believes in during a period of nonviolent struggle, uh, once in power, uh, may become just as bad, if not worse, uh, if the people who, prece who preceded them. And uh, this gentleman here uh, is a good example of that dynamic uh, in practice. Uh, this is uh, Frederick Chiluba, the second president of Zambia. In the 1970s and 1980s, Chiluba was a very prominent activist uh, promoting greater democratic progress uh, in that country. He suffered tremendous personal loss for that activism, went to prison several times, uh, and turned down uh, lucrative, uh, lucrative opportunities for wealth and political power. And because of his activism, uh, when Zambia had its democratic transition in 1990 and 1991, uh, Chiluba was a, a leading figure in that country's movement for multi-party democracy uh, and became its presidential candidate. However, uh, once in power, uh, President Chiluba oversaw this period uh, in Zambian history. This is the uh, political corruption index uh, from the Varieties of Democracy Project. Uh, the yellow vertical lines there indicate the beginning and end of uh, Chiluba's presidency in 1991 and 2001. Uh, and I think, yeah, the, uh, the, the trend line there speaks, uh, pretty much speaks for itself. A, a huge increase uh, in political corruption. Uh, if you ask just about any Zambian activist or political leader, they will all relate a story in which soon after coming into office, uh, Frederick Chiluba proudly announced that he never knew that power could be so sweet. Which, can you be more on the nose than that? I don't think you can. Okay, something more positive. Third lesson on maintaining mobilization. Uh, maintain a democratic vision. Again, often these uh, often nonviolent resistance movements in non-democracies are motivated by negative goals, uh, by the idea that there is a hated, there is a particularly hated dictator or non-democratic regime in power uh, that we want to oust. Of course, the famous motto, uh, the, you know, the famous motto of the Arab Spring was, "The people want the downfall of the regime." And this is very useful for mobilization purposes. It's easy to unite disparate factions around shared hatred of those in power. But if your, uh, if your agenda is limited uh, to these negative goals, to getting rid of uh, hated figures in power, uh, then there is very little reason uh, for ordinary people to remain mobilized once the hated figure is gone. Um, and the political transition in Brazil provides a good example of the opposite of this, of activists thinking intentionally about framing their movement in terms of long-term goals and the long-term transformation of society rather than simply the negative goals of ousting a non-democratic regime. From the beginning of this movement, activists in Brazil argued that getting rid of the military was only a means to an end rather than the end itself. The end was a deeper transformation of society. 
Pursuing that deeper transformation kept activism going on many different fronts throughout the transitional period. Uh, a quote from a Brazilian political scientist, uh, popular movements believed that organized efforts should be arranged in order to avoid the demobilizing effects of transition through transaction and to maximize the prospects of making a break with the past. Aspirations for a more just society could only be achieved if popular pressure and participation were exercised. So three lessons on maintaining mobilization, fostering independent civic forces, keeping new leaders accountable, and maintaining a democratic vision. What about uh, street radicalism? Well, the first lesson here is to avoid uh, what I call extreme protest tactics. Nonviolent resist resistance movements are powerful in part because their tactics disrupt the functioning of ordinary political, social, and economic life. Of course, in the context of a non-democratic regime, this means that they have tremendous power to achieve political change. But in the context of a political transition, this means that they also have tremendous power uh, to disrupt the establishment of any new institutional order. Uh, and this, in turn, this sort of perpetual undermining, perpetual instability, uh, can undermine uh, faith in democracy and lead to a desire uh, for a return to authoritarianism. And Nepal is a very good example of this at work. Uh, various political and social groups in that country, particularly the country's political parties, have frequently uh, employed the most extreme protest tactics one can think of, from general strikes to uh, total blockades of the, country's, uh, of the country's trade routes with India, which have uh, devastating effects on that country's economy. A study by, the, uh, by two economists at the Nepal Central Bank uh, determined that general strikes from 2008 to 2012 decreased annual GDP growth in that country between 0.6 and 2.2 percentage points per year. And the effect, uh, again, as I, as I talked about before, has been to undermine faith in democracy as the Nepali people lose confidence that the political system can, de uh, can deliver uh, economic development. Uh, when I spoke to sort of activists and political leaders in Nepal, even some of the most central figures uh, in that country's movement against the monarchy in 2006 spoke about the need for a period of return to authoritarianism uh, of the estimates range between 10 and 20 years uh, in, order to get the to, in order to get the economy back on track and end this uh, perpetual instability. So these tactics can have extreme consequences. Next, directing mobilization uh, towards supporting new institutions. Uh, and here, uh, Brazil uh, provides another positive example. A lot of political mobilization, but that mobilization was mostly directed towards uh, transforming new institutional channels of political participation, particularly uh, the Brazilian constitution. Civil society groups uh, and other uh, non-elite organizations uh, advocated for uh, popular amendments in part to the Constitution uh, to push for a, pro for a progressive agenda, 122 of which uh, were proposed and ended up getting uh, concessions uh, such, as, um, <clears throat> such as a constitutionally mandated right to strike, uh, universal health care through that country's unified health system, uh, and policies to fight inequality uh, such as the expropriation of unproductive land. Final lesson on uh, maintaining on uh, combating street radicalism, uh, not shutting everyone from the old regime out. Of course, a strong impulse in many of these transitions is for a sharp break with the past and punishment uh, for all or almost all of those involved in the old regime. Now, accountability for the abuses of the past is certainly important, uh, and uh, in particular, uh, human rights abusers uh, should certainly be prosecuted. But often, uh, this effort to shut out those from the past uh, has less to do with accountability and more to do with uh, vindictiveness towards one's political rivals. Uh, and Zambia here provides another good example. Uh, this is Kenneth Kaunda, uh, the first president of Zambia uh, and its president during a period of non-democratic rule. Kaunda, as I mentioned before, ousted uh, in the 1991 movement for multi-party democracy, uh, but sought to re-enter politics a few years later and by all accounts uh, sought to enter democratic politics honestly, uh, that he was interested uh, not in a return to authoritarianism, uh, but in simply being a part of the political system. Uh, however, uh, the government uh, under uh, Frederick Chaluba was deeply afraid of Kaunda, afraid of him as a political rival, first began using government resources to attempt to disrupt his party's mobilization, and ended up indeed uh, amending the Zambian constitution 
uh, not explicitly naming President Kaunda, but to the effect uh, that he was really the sole political figure in Zambia to which a particular constitutional amendment would apply, barring him from running for the presidency. Uh, the effect of this uh, was that Kaunda's political party lost faith in democracy and began formulating the so-called zero option plan uh, to create political instability uh, and, uh, and overthrow the democratic government. This led to a state of emergency, significant rollbacks of civil liberties, uh, and a pattern of anti-democratic uh, back and forth politics in Zambia that continues to today. So uh, these lessons, of course, mostly focused uh, on uh, activists within these particular countries. Uh, but of course, uh, we in the United States are not going through a civil resistance transition just yet. Um, and so uh, what, can, what can external actors uh, do in this regard? What is the role for people outside of these particular situations uh, who may be interested in promoting democratic progress uh, in these particular countries? Uh, well, uh, the first uh, is a bit of a negative lesson, but something that came quite consistently uh, from uh, activists that I spoke to, is to honor uh, local autonomy. Uh, independent civic forces need independence both from local, politi local political forces as well as uh, and also, also from uh, international donors. Uh, if they are going to remain connected to local needs, uh, if they are going to be mobilizing people around uh, the issues that are most important to them, uh, then they need to be, they need to have that a certain level of autonomy. Um, I will just uh, leave that quote up there for your, uh, for your perusal uh, from one of the uh, Nepali civil society leaders uh, that I spoke to. Uh, next, international actors uh, can play a role in helping to foster the kind of long-term strategic thinking uh, that can keep movements going beyond the moment when they oppose a dictator. And I think one particularly useful way of doing this uh, that came up in, in several conversations uh, is the idea of connecting activists with those who have previously gone through this kind of transition. Sharing the, the lessons learned from other contexts um, so, that, uh, so that activists can be thinking about, uh, the long -term, about the long term in their own cases. Uh, and finally, uh, simply consistently honoring uh, particular foreign policy principles. Uh, of course, international, uh, international actors are viewed skeptically in many of these cases because uh, they are perceived as self-interested and, and uh, advocacy around things like human rights principles or international law uh, are perceived as uh, hypocritical. But when this, is, uh, when this advocacy is more consistent, uh, it can be quite helpful in raising, uh, in raising awareness about uh, the needs of particular activist groups and promoting democratic progress. Uh, so in conclusion, nonviolent resistance is indeed a powerful democratizing force, uh, but this force is by no means automatic. Uh, in order to carry it through the uncertain period of transition, activists and political forces need to continue to mobilize and to avoid street radicalism and direct that mobilization uh, towards building new political institutions. Uh, with that, uh, I'm done. Thank you so much for your time, and I'm very much looking forward to our discussion. Perfect. A lot of good food, uh, uh, good food for thought. And uh, I will first uh, start from introducing briefly our panelists, and uh, each of them will have a couple of minutes to reflect on uh, Jonathan's uh, presentation. Uh, so first of all, Dr. Nancy, Nancy O'Kale. Uh, she is an executive director of the Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy and has more than 18 years uh, of experience working on issues of democracy, rule of law, human rights, security in the Middle East and North Africa. She analyzes these issues and advocates in favor of human rights through testimony to legislative bodies, providing policy recommendations to senior government officials in the US and Europe. In a short trial uh, organized by the Egyptian post-revolutionary regime, uh, Dr. O'Kale was among 43 uh, NGO workers who were convicted in 2012 and sentenced to prison for allegedly using foreign funds to foment unrest in Egypt. She holds a PhD from the University of Sussex in the UK, and uh, her doctoral research focused on the power relations of foreign aid. Um, next is Melinda Haring. Uh, 
uh, is the editor of the Ukraine Alert blog as part of the Atlantic Council. She's also the vice chair of the board of East European Foundation in Kiev, Ukraine, and a fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she's a long-term observer of political developments in Eurasia, Euro specifically in Ukraine, and uh, her articles were featured in a number of uh, media outlets, Washington Post, Foreign Affairs, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and so on. And uh, she is uh, the author of the report Reforming the Democracy, Bureaucracy, and Ukraine's Internal Displaced Persons Hold a Key to Peace. She's also contributed to the book Does Democracy Matter? She holds MA in government with a certificate in Russian European uh, Studies from Georgetown University. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Maria Stefan is the director of the program on nonviolent action here at uh, USIP. She's also a lifetime member of the Council on Foreign Relations. She was formerly a non-resident fellow at Atlantic Council, where she co-led the Future of Authoritarianism, Authoritarianism Project. And uh, she also worked at my center, uh, the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict, directing policy and research portfolio. She was also the lead foreign affairs officer in the US State Department Bureau of Conflict and Stabilization Operations, where she worked on both operations, uh, policy and operations for Afghanistan and Syria. She is an author of many publications on civil resistance, including a seminal book, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, written together with Erika Chenoweth. Uh, she holds MA in, in PG from Fletcher, School of Law and Diplomacy, and Bachelor of Degree from Boston College. She is from Vermont, and like me, <laughs> she, like me, she has also, uh, uh, she's also of Polish descent. <laughs> so, terrific panel. Um, and uh, so first of all, I will start uh, from Nancy, and I will ask Nancy to um, pick up the key kind of findings from uh, Jonathan's presentation and bring that, uh, those findings to your experience uh, observing transition in Egypt. How accurate those findings might explain certain developments and uh, what might have been there with the transition in Egypt that um, kind of be go beyond um, you know, monograph focus and can still shed more light on our uh, better understanding of how transition can start and be, I guess, derailed in terms of building democracy. Right. Thank you so much, and thank you for having me. Um, I enjoyed reading the monograph, and it kind of be more timely than today, and also thought-provoking. Um, I really enjoyed reading like the different factors that lead to like a different destinies of whether violent or nonviolent resistance. One of the things is the conditions that are out there and the structures. Uh, when the resistance start, uh, because that has a lot of effect on how the movement goes forward. Um, the other thing is that I really, really particularly uh, liked and thought a lot about is the idea of moving from street radicalization into political mobilization. Um, and several other nuances and in, in the integration of different factors. Yet when I think about Egypt, I hardly was able to place it mm -hmm. anywhere in, in there. Uh, there is, of course, some reflections out there. And I think um, when I think what happened in Egypt and why are we where at the point we are today, um, I think to start with, there was an over-idealization of mm. how the Egyptian mm. uprising mm. started and this mm. description. It was almost patronizing. Mm. Speaking of like the beautiful Egyptian youth who are holding hands and singing Kumbaya and uh, how the, the Muslims were praying and the Christians were protecting them. It was un it's idealistic to a harmful way mm -hmm. because the reason why people go against authoritarian regimes is not, of course, like freedom and rights is, is an end of its own, but because authoritarian regimes produce unhealthy societies. Mm -hmm. If this is the product of Mubarak's regime, then he was really great if we're producing such society that is equal, that is tolerant, that is um, progressive in so many ways that is described there. But in reality, that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. Because of the unequal dynamics and unequal power relations and corruption and impunity, this is the case that are there. The other thing that I, I found problematic, and maybe through the questions and answer elaborating on that, because I only have two minutes, is that there's always 
when people describe, not just in Egypt, but elsewhere, there is always an imaginary isolated spheres when we talk about the government, the people, and the activists, mm -hmm. as if they are separated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually the entanglement of those three spheres, even if we can at least even to start with, separate them in three spheres because it's more complex than that. Um, it leads to like misdiagnoses and, and um, uh, some false assumptions about how those dynamics work. Again, and um, one of the things that you mentioned and I really, really liked that you said that because so, although it's obvious, <laughs> but some people miss it, is not just because someone went to prison and struggled that when he comes to power is going to be mm. like, uh, like sort of a democratic leader uh, with integrity and everything. Uh, and it's actually only more likely that he goes the other way mm. because it's, he does not go and start from a vacuum. It starts in a structure that has its limitation, the lack of accountability mechanisms to start with, and also most importantly is the lack of skills and competence. Mm -hmm. So it, I think there is like a common criticism in Egypt and everywhere which you describe that people know what they don't want, but they don't know what they want. Mm -hmm. I think to an extent people knew what they want. Like they wanted justice, they wanted um, uh, equality and all this. But they don't know how to get there, mm. and they don't have the, the competence to enforce policy, to form policy, mm. the experience of governance, mm. which is impossible because if they had an experience in governance, they, they would have part, <laughs> been a part of, of, of such government. Mm. And this is one of the biggest challenge, is like how to govern, how to learn, how to actually move, mm. not just from the street to politics, but from politics to the art and act and ability to govern. Mm. And this is one of the biggest challenge that we have, mm. I think. I'm going to stop here and I, just, sure. I know that Thank there's you, short time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> you. I mean, for, for me, the key lesson that you mentioned was this uh, preparation of the civil society by the movement for the ensuing transition. Um, and um, civil society as being a product of authoritarian is something that civil resistors need to take account. So I wonder to what extent in Ukraine case, after the revolution of dignity in 2014, the society was prepared by the movement for that you know, democratization and, and transition. Uh, Melinda. Sure. So let me back up just a little bit because not everyone in this room watches Ukraine as obsessively as I do and my two friends in the front row. So in 2014, uh, many normal average Ukrainians were freezing in the center of Kiev and they pushed Viktor Yanukovych out of power. And he was deeply corrupt. But I, I want to dig into what Jonathan and his new excellent report have to say about the Ukraine case. He has a wonderful quote. He says, the elephant got through but its tail is stuck. The elephant got through, but its tail is stuck. I think that perfectly captures where Ukraine is today. Uh, they got rid of Yanukovych, but they're still stuck in transition, and it's really, really hard. So Jonathan said that continued civic mobilization during the transition is crucial. Yes, I absolutely agree, but it's so hard. Uh, and finding those themes and keeping people engaged is incredibly difficult. He also said that a move away from uh, this radicalism, the all or nothing struggle to, toward uh, more institutionalized politics is essential. And in Ukraine, I see that. Reformers are in many parties in parliament today, and that's a great thing. Uh, you also pointed out that non-resistance puts pro-democracy leaders in power. And we saw this in, in 2014. New people came into government, uh, business leaders, civic leaders, people who had nothing to do, scientists, people who had nothing to do with politics. Uh, one of them is in, in the front row, uh, my, my friend from the Kiev City Council, who's a, a, a lawyer. And after the Maidan, many of these people uh, came and they're serving in you know, small, medium. Uh, they're also serving in the executive bodies as well, as well as parliament. Uh, what you said about holding leaders to account is absolutely spot on, and civil society is doing that. Civil society is incredibly strong and powerful uh, in Ukraine. Uh, you talked about the importance of maintaining a democratic vision, uh, and that's, like we said, that's very, very difficult. Um, but I, I'm happy to say that civil society is reflective in Ukraine, and they're changing and thinking about uh, 
that the struggle uh, for democracy and for reform and for the country that they all worked hard for is going to take a lot longer than four and a half years. Mm. It's probably going to take, it's going to be a generational project mm. and it's no longer a sprint. Mm. It's a marathon. Mm. So when I'm in my conversations with civil society leaders, they're, they're thinking about, uh, they have a longer term horizon now. And I, I think that's a, 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 a mature sign. Uh, you said that there's a huge gap between getting rid of an old system and establishing a new one. And I think both Nancy and I would say amen, amen to that. Uh, it's it's very hard. I do see some challenges uh, in, in your report. One of them we talked about earlier. Uh, you talked about the importance of a free press. Uh, and in Ukraine, the major uh, television stations are all owned by oligarchs. Uh, you have some free press, but it's not very free. And TV is... TV is everything there, and you don't have a culture of philanthropy. So uh, you have you express some skepticism uh, with the international donor community, and there, there's reasons to be skeptical. But what do you do in a country like Ukraine when the the free press is a problem and the the culture of ph philanthropy is just not there? Uh, and the last question I had was, uh, you talked about rapid democratization, and you said if it takes place early in the transition, the balance of forces often goes back to the elites, and that there's there can be limited de uh, democratization and backsliding. And I was wondering if you could um, say a little bit more about that. How early in the transition, and what does that time frame look like? But congratulations, I really enjoyed it. And uh, our friends from Ukraine will be taking it back and studying it as well. Hi. Thank you, Melinda. Maria, um, I wanted to ask you to bring the kind of external uh, actors perspective and the policy community and how policy community could be, I think, more effective in helping civil resistors uh, prepare better for transition, given all those obstacles and challenges that um, uh, Jonathan uh, has identified. And uh, if you can refer maybe to specific cases, I think Ukraine would be prominently perhaps there, um, standing in terms of the role of, of international actors in helping uh, transition there. So yes, what is, what is your take from the kind of external perspective? Sure, thanks Mache. And again, congratulations Jonathan, really um, terrific. Uh, monograph and he wrote it in a way that made it very relevant and appealing to activists especially and also to policymakers and that's not easy to do so congratulations on that um, I think the two kind of key things that I took away from the, from the monograph was you know you come down very strong on the idea that the surest pathway from authoritarianism is civil resistance. Um, yet what happens during that transition period is really critical. And you very help, helpfully isolate two variables, the sustained healthy civic mobilization during the transition and the avoidance or minimalization of street radicalism um, as two key factors that help to consolidate democracy. And I think just reflecting perhaps a couple minutes on three key sets of actors. So from a donor funder perspective, um, I think you rightfully um, uh, encourage caution when it comes to supporting civic actors um, and especially civil resistors movements. Your central argument is that, you know, um, movements thrive on their grassrootedness, their linkages to local communities, being able to address and represent their needs. And sometimes there's an overzealousness and enthusiasm in the donor community to want to help. Um, and so that can sometimes translate into distortions with funding, um, to cutting people off from their key constituencies, um, to kind of creating a, a competitiveness. So I must say I really appreciated your um, kind of your, your, um, your idea of really being cautious with the type of support that's needed. What you honed in on, which I think is really, really essential, is what external actors, both in the funding community, also diplomats and embassies can do very well and helpfully is to convene disparate parties of society. So they can help bring together the grassroots activists, the more traditional technocratic NGO leaders, the moderate government officials to help come up with the D-Day plus one strategy. So what does the transition look like practically? What are the key lines of effort just to build trust between these communities and to help build relationships that ultimately are going to help get through um, the transition period? I also think, as you noted, civil resistance is a lot about 
about disruption. It's about imposing costs. Mm -hmm. It's about power shifts. Mm -hmm. And engagement with governments and with other actors requires a different skill set. Mm -hmm. And so there is an element of knowing how to dialogue, knowing how to facilitate conversations, knowing how to get to yes, um, build coalitions for change. And that's a different skill set. So I, I actually think this bringing together of nonviolent action and peace building skills and approaches is really, really critical to be able to address the challenges during the transition period. Um, I also think we talk a lot about support directly to civil society and movements, but I think external actors are often in the best position to share shape the environment around which these actors are operating. So for example, uh, corruption is an endemic problem in many authoritarian countries and is a problem during the transition. One of the most important thing I think that government officials can do, multilateral organizations, is hone in on the corruption element, mm -hmm. hone in on where the stolen assets are, really focus on supporting independent um, anti-corruption agencies, commissions and the like, supporting the in investigative journalists who are trying to uncover these things. So I think there's a really, really important role. One really great example is the role that um, the SICIG Commission in Guatemala received, the, the International Commission focused on impunity. There was incredible support for that, which gave, I think, um, a lot of support to the activists on the ground. The final thing that I would flag, um, because it's less, I think, um, it's less heard of in this town especially, is the role that security forces play mm -hmm. in democratic transitions. So we know that there's a very strong link between security force defections and civil resistance victories. So there's, there are plenty of data to suggest that. But I think the role that security forces play in either supporting democratic processes or undermining them is really, really important. And there are a lot of tools and levers that the U.S. military, other militaries have to influence the behaviors, attitudes, and practices of security forces in other countries including allied countries that I think would be particularly useful. And in this respect, I would flag Admiral Dennis Blair's really helpful um, book, which is called Military Engagement, Influencing Armed Forces Worldwide to Support Democratic Transitions. I think there's a lot there that could help broaden the aperture in terms of how to support during this critical period. But thank you. Perfect. Thank you. So I would like to follow up on a couple of themes and then give um, uh, some time for Jonathan to respond and we will open the, the floor for questions. Um, actually, I wanted to build on that military um, aspect uh, because, as Maria said, a number of nonviolent uh, resistance actions that were successful, they were successful because they were effectively defections from the military. And I think Egypt is uh, an interesting case. And Nancy, I wanted um, uh, to ask you to expand on that. Uh, where basically uh, what I saw was collusion between the activists and the military to um, bring down, and we, I'm talking about 2013, the beginning of 2013, to bring, uh, bring down um, democratically elected uh, President Morsi, where um, the activists came to the military and asked, so, uh, you know, we don't like the, the president, he is introducing Islamic laws, and we are concerned about liberties, what can you do to help us? Um, and they said, well, bring millions of people on the streets, and we will certainly do something. Uh, and when they indeed, activists brought millions of people on, on the streets in 2013, late June, military gave ultimatum to uh, Morsi and brought it down and took over power. So I wanted you know, to, to expand more on this, the need to work with the military to achieve political breakthrough and then the role of um, you know, military during transition uh, and what, how activists should prepare, I think, better to ensure that military will not take over that transition and it will ensure the democratization. And um, um, Melinda, I wanted to maybe ask you to expand more on this old new elites uh, because what I saw after the, um, uh, after the Orange Revolution and on after the um, uh, Revolution of Dignity is the same old faces of these old leaders staying in power. And I'm not talking about young uh, activists entering parliament and being in parliamentary committees, but I'm talking about key decision makers that are basically the same old uh, guards uh, that were working in the 1990s and uh, um, um, working with Kuchma and even with, with Yanukovych being in charge and um, being responsible for the reforms. And uh, in terms of external actors, um, 
uh, I, fo I, I, was, I was thinking more about, um, Maria, if you could maybe tap on your ongoing research on the role of external actors that you are uh, leading in terms of the uh, different phases of uh, civil resistance uh, and the type of uh, perhaps um, aid and assistance that those external actors can provide in the kind of uh, the phase when uh, civil resistors are struggling to bring down uh, the regime and then um, having a different types of challenges once that regime kind of is removed and those activists are giving an opportunity to influ influence transitional change. Maybe if you can identify two, two uh, important assistant um, uh, um, factors that you already see from your ongoing research on the, um, on the external actors for, for the kind of pre um, uh, regime change phase and, and then, then after. And uh, Jonathan, I, I saw in your presentation uh, when you were uh, presenting the graph that combine uh, you know, street radicalization and mobilization that some of um, um, dots, they were outliers. Basically, they had both processes, street radicalization and uh, mobilization, and they were democracies. I mean, they build democracies. So despite your, uh, and I think, quite accurate analysis that street radicalization, radicalization is negative for, dem for democratic uh, transition, you have some outliers that had both uh, very high mobilization and very high street radicalization and still kind of faring relatively well on the democracy score in your, in your study. So if you can reflect on that. Um, for like a minute or two, each of you, if I can challenge you on the time. And, uh, and then we'll proceed. Um, yeah. yeah, Jonathan, maybe can you can start with me. Here we can start. Okay. Um, well, thanks so much, first to all of you, for your wonderful comments, and uh, and I, I appreciate them, and, and look forward to continuing to discuss them. Um, Machi, in regard to that, yeah, your specific question, it's true. There are, you know, it's there are there are outliers there, and I think the. Uh, the, the social scientist cop-out answer is that uh, it's not a deterministic relationship. Um, but to, uh, yeah, to not leave it at that, to dig, it in, to dig into it a little bit more. I mean, I do think these are, these are factors that we, see a, we do see a consistent effect, but the effect is variable. And so there are... There are, many other, there are many other factors that come into the period of transition, and even, um, even as, as Nancy was bringing up before, structural factors in relation to the character of the old regime, the character of, say, you know, the society's economic system, that sort of thing, that can affect the particular dynamics uh, of, these, of these factors. Um, and so, you know, it's not uh, something I, I, I always emphasize, particularly when I'm talking to, to activists, uh, is that this isn't a, you know, these are, these are nudges, not recipes. Um, that this is, you know, this is something that may help you have insight into, you know, people who have been in other situations similar to yours. Um, but I always, I always assume that, you know, an activist, a political leader uh, from a, a country going through transition understands their situation better than I do. Um, and so, you know, I leave, it to them, I leave it to them to interpret those particular nudges in specific cases. Um, so, yeah. Would you like to say a few words about what uh, the panelists kind of brought up? Sure. Um, so let's see. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for the, the comments about the external uh, support uh, component. I will admit that was uh, the aspect of the monograph that I was most hesitant to discuss with this particular audience. Um, <laughs> I mean, and, and again, I think, I think the, the core thing that I do try and emphasize both in the monograph and in kind of broader work uh, is this, the international community uh, can sometimes suck the air out of local mobilization. Uh, that because in many of these countries the resource differential between local civil society uh, and the international community is so vast. Um, if the international community is coming in. Uh, if you are a sort of a young, intelligent, civic-minded uh, kind of person, but you also want to support your family, you also want to have a nice career, uh, then it tends to be the, uh, the most lucrative way to do that is to pursue international funding opportunities uh, rather than you know, the particular needs that your local community may be expressing. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes, um, and I would say this was particularly the case uh, expressed to me in, in Nepal, uh, 
Um, oftentimes, the, the people who would be the leaders of grassroots movements uh, instead spend most of their time writing grant applications. Um, and grants are often quite are often very necessary, um, but that's a, a challenging dynamic that can be problematic for, for grassroots mobilization. Mm -hmm. and, that's kind of, and that's kind of the core thing that, I'm, that I want to emphasize. Um, I mean, I'll just I'll just build on that yeah. because this this idea has been surfaced um, actually in a uh, research that my team is currently conducting, which is focused on the role of external funding and training yeah. on movements for transparency, accountability, mm. and good governance. And the countries that they have looked at are uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Guatemala, Ukraine, and Zimbabwe and Burma mm. are coming up. So I would say that definitely one of the findings, um, Davin O'Regan is leading this effort. One of the main findings is just that a lot of uh, donor support can be very much strings attached mm -hmm. kind of thing mm -hmm. and kind of takes the activists away from kind of some of the core organizing movement building work that they would otherwise do. This is not to say that external support for technocratic things like how to engage in constitutional processes, like how to monitor budgets, like how to do basic things are not important, but I think there needs to be a rebalancing a bit um, um, between kind of support for the flexible, autonom more autonomous autonomous oriented funding right. that support grassroots mobilization and movement building that support organizing mm. and you know because organizing is kind of at the core I mm. think of sustainable yeah. transitions and yeah. organizing is a skill set yeah. that's linked to but different from civil resistance mm. and so I think kind of finding ways to bring these together is something that do, like donor actors can do very very well mm. um, so I would say kind of in the funding element also we know activists generally when in the moment when they're in the kind of peak mobilization moment, they need f kind of uh, small amounts of flexible funds quickly. That's usually going to help them more than having, you know, a million dollars over two years in that moment. Mm -hmm. So kind of the rapid response funding, I think, is really, really important. And I think during that um, kind of peak moment, the ability of diplomats from different embassies to coordinate their activities, because sometimes the biggest problems in mass mobilizations is that the external actors are fundamentally not coordinated. They're doing different things, have different approaches, have different priorities. So donor coordination and embassy coordination in these moments I think is really key, and using whatever levers uh, security forces, defense officials have to mitigate repression targeting activists I think is really, really important during that phase. In the post, that's where bringing in the skill sets of how to get involved in constitutional development processes, electoral reform processes, anti-corruption mechanisms, kind of bringing the worlds of the technocratic skills together with the mobilizing and organizing, I think is particularly helpful during the post period. Okay. Great. Nancy, um, about the collusion with the, you know, between activists and military. Um, I have a different reading than what you put it. I mean, I, I think the conclusion is the same. But it sounded like we're seeing like, that the military was sitting out there and the activists went to them and said, like, please come and help us. That never happened. It was actually the opposite. It's from the very beginning of the 18 days of uh, the revolution in January 2011, it is actually the military decided to go to the street. And they played and the message for them is like, we will never shoot anyone and we are peaceful and everything. And again, that was an over idealization because like there were people who were being captured and tortured by the military during that time. And then of course, like one of the most disappointing moments for me is the day of February 11th, when the military decided to take over the transition mm. and then told the people in Tahrir Square, like, go home, we're going to take over, let's wipe away the graffiti and everything and clean up the square. Mm. I think this is one of the biggest problems. And yet even the activists at that time did not surrender to that. It is actually because of the continuous mobilization in the street the weeks after, because at the beginning, Mubarak just moved to Sharm el-Sheikh. He was not going to be tried. And it's because of the continuous protesting and mobilization and pressure is that they decided to actually put him on trial. I mean, of course, he's out now, but at that time, that was effective. I think the other thing is like we keep on talking about like the internal dynamics, but I think the role of international actors 
are usually, I would say, more harmful than useful because at the end of the day, international actors or international policymakers, they always want to think of the direct, easy, fast track. Um, and I would say, if, if, well, if I want to summarize it in what I would say, a little bit of messiness is actually healthy. Mm. But that was not allowed in Egypt. Mm. They wanted to have what I would say, like what I would call like procedural democracy. I remember uh, yesterday was the anniversary, the seventh anniversary of the Maspiro massacre, where military tanks ran over mm. Christian protests, peaceful mm. Christian protesters. And at that time, a few months later, when again, like there was the time of uh, Mohammed Mahmoud Battle, where people were protesting in the street, 50 were killed and thrown in the garbage. I was talking to one of the top officials in the US, and it's just like being puzzled by like the continuous um, unconditional support to the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, who was taking over the transition at that time. And the response was like, don't worry about it. It's like once there are elections and there's a president, all this will be resolved. Mm. And that moment, I knew things are incredibly going into the wrong direction. And the same thing when we talk about June, 20, uh, June 30th in 2013, it wasn't particularly that the people went to the military as like, please come and remove Morsi and help us. It was actually a continuous frustration by the collusion of the Muslim Brotherhood and the military together. Uh, and it was actually the oversight on a lot of the um, uh, malpractices and, and, and the, um, uh, the, the torture and the imprisonment conducted by the military that the Muslim Brotherhood decided to overlook and overlook um, um, fact-finding commissions reports and put them away. Um, and the military was going to do that anyways. Of course, as any military coup, they always play on uh, like a popular support. They don't go into the street on their own and remove people. There is always like the people hailing them. So, and, and the thing about this, I'm not saying that um, the reading is just wrong. It's also unrealistic when we say people colluding with the military, there is an unequal relationship here. Like you have a whole military with power and tanks and guns. Why would they have to listen to activists who are coming to say, let's do that, it's a good idea. So Nancy, can actual activists somehow prepared, you know, for possible military takeover? Is there anything on the part of activists in Egypt that they could, they could have done better or differently in order basically to um, you know, resist that takeover, or it was inevitable that military, you know, would have done that anyway. I wouldn't say it's inevitable, but the, with the benefit of hindsight, um, I think there would there would have been some missed opportunities of some um, creating some allegiances that would help put pressure, that would stop the direction that we were going through. Uh, and I think also, again, the, the, the interference, and I would say like more of the meddling of international actors at that time would, I would say like it's hindered the ability for people to actually act mm -hmm. this way. And again, it's very difficult to think of how would they do that because um, as Maria rightly and spot on pointed out, it is the lack of focus on the structure and the condition. It's not about supporting particular activists or the activists, but is supporting an environment that is conducive to a democratic movement. The pressure on the freedom of the press, anti-corruption uh, commissions, uh, fact-finding commissions, things that is like that enables the environment where people like changing the rules of the game, basically, not the players. And I think that was the main problem in Egypt. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. So I would say that in the case of Ukraine, uh, the opposite is true, true about the international donor community. Without the international donor community, we would not have seen the progress that Ukraine has made over the last four and a half years. The international donor community with Ukrainian civil society and with reformers in government have squeezed the government to do the right thing, oftentimes when it didn't want to. I can give you many specific examples of all kinds of uh, institutions that were put in place because of the squeeze. And without the pressure from the international donor community, good, good luck. 
um, I, I, when you, the two of you were talking, I, I had another thought um, about transitions. Mm. Um, and we tend to treat these periods as they're endless. They're not endless, right? We're talking about people. And people have expectations. And if you don't fulfill those expectations, they're going to they're gonna say, I'm not really up for this austerity stuff you want me to, to, to sign up for. Um, so I would just, uh, my, from my perspective of watching these <coughs> transitions in Ukraine, there's a limited window in which you can ask people to put up with austerity and tough conditions until they see, uh, you know, the results. Mm. Uh, and I really worry about Ukraine that you've sort of hit that window mm. uh, and that people are, are not going to be willing to put up with, uh, you, you know, austerity for much longer mm. if they don't see some results. On your question on the same old faces, absolutely. It's very depressing. There are young faces in the pipeline. I write about them all the time. Please read our blog. <laughs> <laughs> um, but let, let's be real. Uh, 2019, really big elections in Ukraine, parliamentary, presidential. Right now, there's something between 24 and 27 candidates who've declared. N not much new blood. Uh, right now, if you put a gun to my head, I'm going to tell you the second round is probably Yulia Tymoshenko, former vice president or former prime minister, or uh, President Poroshenko, the incumbent. So you're you're probably looking at the same old faces. Um, I am not. I am very very impatient. So I find this ironic that I have to say this, but give them time. There are good people, good ethical people who are moving up the system. Uh, and Ukraine, again, it's going to be a generational project. It's not a four or five or six year transition. Uh, and the U.S. government and the donor community needs to stand uh, with these, these people who are doing the right thing and continue to, exactly what Maria said, to keep supporting the anti-corruption agenda. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely uh, crucial to support these new institutions like the National Anti-Corruption Bureau of, of Ukraine the organization that's trying to put high-level crooks behind bars. And we also need to do something else. The State Department, I hope you're listening, they need to find someone <clears throat> like former President Biden who has a relationship and can call Poroshenko and say, what the hell are you doing? We're watching you. We need to establish a better relationship. The Obama administration did this very well with Biden. Mm. Uh, and, and put them on notice. We care about civil society. We care about the, the, the direction your country is going in. And we know what's going on. Just because it's domestic politics doesn't mean you get a free pass. Yeah. I mean, I, yes, the role of external actors are very important. Um, we might be, at the same time, putting too much trust and hope in those external actors. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the transitions, <laughs> transitions, eventually the outcomes of the transitions are really driven by the grassroots. And yes, the external actors are important, but, um, you know, looking at in the case of Poland, uh, there is so much uh, that depends on the strategies and, and tactics that are undertaken by the civil society uh, that are pushing those transitions forward with the help and assistance uh, of the external actors. So I would like to uh, thank the panelists and I would like to keep them here on the stage uh, Why I open right now floor to questions. Uh, I see Peter Ackerman there in the back. Uh, Peter. Yes. Oh, yes. So, yes. We'll take three questions and then... So, Peter, go ahead. Oh. Oh. Jonathan, great. Uh, really great presentation. Great presentation from all of you. When I did my thesis 400 years ago, <laughs> I looked at um, the most different idea that you're presenting, but only one dimension, a planned movement and a completely spontaneous movement, India versus the first Russian Revolution. Mm. My question to you is that you've taken three cases and you've now determined that they're the most different. I'd love to know how you think about identifying in general what the most different is. And the second point I'd like to make with my friend talking about Egypt, um, I think it's very dangerous to think, of, wrong word, I think thinking about the revolution being to hear square is a mistake. We just did a movie that I invite you all to look at called um, Egypt um, <clears throat> revolution interrupted. If you go back to the five or seven, eight years prior to that, there were coalitions being formed amongst judges, amongst students, amongst union members, and amongst the Muslim Brotherhood. We, ICNC, was invited into the Khaldun Center in 2007, and we had 40 odd people talking about nonviolent resistance that we do with workshops, and all those interests were represented. 
I think what you look and see what happened in Egypt is that ultimately that coalition was broken up because the military and the Muslim Brotherhood created a relationship and that created other tensions. The point being is that it's, I think it's, you know, what, one of the things that's very important in the work we do is, is to basically counter the argument that prior conditions determine the outcomes of these movements. And what we try to work on and, and to illustrate is that it's not the prior conditions, it's the choices in the middle of the conflict that ultimately determine the outcome. And there were choices made, and there's choices that could be unmade in Egypt or in any other conflict. So to get to the work my way back to one point you made is that it's important to maintain uh, the ability to think strategically post a conflict. Let's remember what strategy is. Strategy is how to basically sequence tactical encounters in favor of larger goals with an adversary's reaction in mind. Mm -hmm. You can't think about strategy without an adversary. The adversary prior to the end of a conflict might be obvious. The adversary post a conflict might be less obvious, but much more in uh, my friend here's work on corruption. That, that is the adversary. But you can't think about strategy without an adversary, and an adversary is always contextual. So the, 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 the promotion of the idea of strategic thinking is like a coach who basically works on an athlete to have them exercise their strategic thinking. It's not a matter of um, talking about strategy in the context of all sorts of cases, but talking about strategy as a planning exercise in one case. So. Thank you, Peter. Barbara? Yeah. Barbara Wien, American University. Uh, thank you for holding Barbara, this. you can take the mic. Thank you for holding this space open in Washington, D.C. for this conversation, which is too rare in policy circles. Um, thank you for your wonderful monograph, and what a stellar panel. Thank you. I wonder if we could measure the presence of labor unions mm -hmm. as one of the key factors in uh, increasing our propensity for democratic transition. I'm thinking specifically of Tunisia. Uh, and Chile, and of course Poland under Lech Walesa, uh, and there are probably others I'm overlooking in the interest of time, um, and also the presence of strong women's movements. I, I wonder if we could uh, e isolate that data. I don't know if they were in your data set, um, but as I look around the world, um, where nonviolent civil resistance is more likely to succeed uh, and be resilient and sustained, I see the presence of those two factors. Um, as someone who worked inside 32 labor unions, uh, they go all the way down to the factory level, as you know, or in the agricultural sector, or in the US government, um, and other governments, bureaucrats who were unionized were also a huge bulk work against authoritarianism. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. Um, uh, let's see, here the lady. Uh, next to Barbara. Oh, Rosie. Yes. Hi, Rosie. Rose. My name is Rosie Berman. I'm with the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. I have two questions. First for Jonathan. I am interested in your commentary on the potential backsliding in Brazil, particularly with Yair Bolsonaro. Mm. And Melinda, I am interested in how you are analyzing the recent attacks on LGBTQ and Roma and other civil society activists by far-right groups in Ukraine. Thank you. OK. Um, let's, um, I mean, I leave up to you to decide which questions you want to address. Um, Jonathan, maybe we can yeah, start sure. from you. Uh, thanks so much for the wonderful questions. Uh, Peter, thanks so much for that. Uh, so. <laughs> In the, I suppose, most different is a bit of a, I'm trying to sort of simplify down a, a somewhat more complex research design. Uh, technically, what I'm doing is nested analysis. So I start with nested analysis. Um, so I start with the, the large N analysis, find a robust relationship, and then look for cases that are kind of on the regression line um, to see whether, you know, whether when I examine those cases qualitatively, uh, the, that the mechanisms that I'm proposing theoretically in the, in the statistical analysis actually obtain and make sense. And I pick cases that are very, very different from one another in terms of 
you know, kind of the time period in which the transition happened, the previous, regi the previous regime, uh, sort of connection to other, you know, other democratic powers, et cetera, uh, because to have a certain external validity, to show that this is not simply a, you know, say, a South Asian story or a Latin American story, but that we see kind of these similar dynamics at work uh, across many, many different cases. Um, so that's kind, of, that's kind of the logic behind, behind that case selection. I'm sorry, I don't know your name, but... Barbara, Barbara. Barbara Wien. Thank you so much for your question. I, I love it because uh, it gives me the opportunity to talk about the research project I'm doing right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that data does not currently exist, but it will soon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, currently, uh, I'm currently working on a project called the Anatomy of Resistance Campaigns, where we are collecting systematic data on all of the organizations that have participated in nonviolent resistance movements. Uh, we are currently doing data collection in Africa uh, from 1990 through 2015, and depending on funding opportunities, if any of you work for the National Science Foundation, that would be, you know, it's a, it's a worthy project. Uh, depending on funding, we will be expanding to, uh, to other parts of the world as well. Uh, and we actually have... Uh, the sort of first paper using that data uh, does actually focus exactly on uh, specifically the role of labor unions. Um, we haven't looked at women's movements specifically yet. Finding, indeed, there is a, a, fairly, uh, a fairly consistent, robust relationship between labor union participation and democratic progress. So your, your intuition is exactly correct, at least in terms of the research that we have done thus far and are hoping to expand. We, no, definitely not. Uh, <laughs> women's movements are, are incredibly crucial. Um, uh, I've had the privilege, because I was at the University of Denver, to attend uh, the, uh, uh, well, some meetings of the Inclusive Global Leadership Institute, uh, which is uh, something which is a, a, a wonderful initiative run by uh, Erica Chenoweth and Marie Berry, who are two professors there, where they bring in uh, groups of women activists from around the world, uh, giving them training in nonviolent resistance, talking about principles of activism, uh, that sort of thing as well. And yes, role is absolutely crucial. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen in Brazil. <laughs> um, I mean, I think the, in relation to this work, I would say, uh, and I, I think uh, for an American audience, this is also useful to keep in mind, democracy is only as good if you keep fighting for it. Good. And one of the panelists would like to take any of the Sure, I'll answer the attack on activists very briefly. Uh, since 2017, there have been at least 57 attacks on activists, 57, including uh, one last week on the, the head of the Kiev City Council, uh, Sergei Gusovsky. He was uh, attacked with green uh, antiseptic liquid. Uh, there have been acid thrown at activists outside of Kiev. The, the problem is that these stories are not being told in the mainstream press. One of the big problems with Ukraine is that there are few, there are so few journalists, Western journalists left telling the story. People have, uh, you know, we have a, a short attention span. Uh, newspapers are getting smaller. Uh, people have gone back to Moscow. They've gone on to other beats. Uh, so it's please, Lantos Commission, please help us make noise. Uh, the activists uh, in Kiev and in Kharkiv and in Odessa, uh, in these smaller places, are depending on us to say their names and to remind the Ukrainian government that we know and that the culture of impunity, impunity has not ended and we're waiting on them to do the right thing. Um, just a quick note on Peter's comment. Um, I think we shouldn't talk about preconditions because, I mean, when we talk about preconditions, it makes it as if, like, resistance or uprising is a decision that people make and say, okay, let's go and we're going to uh, move against this government today. There is the event, but there is also, like, the movement that's behind that. And if you're saying this happened in 2007 and I happened to be there uh, then, but it's also way before that, uh, even since 2002, when we were like fighting for um, changing the NGO law and fighting for the changes in the judiciary that was happening in Egypt. Uh, my point was about the condition, the post-uprising conditions that is maintained and supported mostly by the international 
community and international policymakers because they want things to be settled and, and cleared and removed in essence. That was the point. I just want to say, like, your point about labor unions is spot on. And uh, as obvious as it is sometimes and most of the time is overlooked. And I would say there's something about labor unions that's very important. Uh, first of all, because by nature they're the most organized, non-political actors, and they're effective. But also most importantly, the um, movement of labor is one of the strongest points that dismantle the narrative of the government. Because the government always presents that the mm -hmm. civil society organization and NGOs, those are people who are working for um, Western ideals that does not speak to the actual needs of the people. The people want bread on their table and they want to bring their kids to school. But when it comes from labor, it's completely uh, dismantle this this narrative that they want to present and they fear it the most I mean if some of you know the story of Giulio Ruggini the Italian researchers who went to Egypt and he was studying labor unions um, and he of course like he was captured and tortured to death and thrown in the street uh, and nothing was done about that but yes I completely agree with you on that point yes I I'm mindful of the time, uh, and uh, I will take really two questions, um, and I will then ask the panelists to uh, um, answer those questions as well as give uh, kind of concluding thoughts and comments. Now, you would be able to approach panelists on your own. We are not kind of running away uh, immediately after the event. Yes, we are. Uh, so please do that. <laughs> yes, we are. So, yes, we are. Okay. Are we going to lunch At least right after this? <laughs> most of them will stay, if not all. Okay, uh, the lady in the back. Um, Good morning, I'm Amira Woods, and uh, thank you to USIP and to ICNC for uh, for this for all the work that you all do and your leadership on this issue. Um, great research and analysis and the report. The only area I wanted to kind of push a little bit on is on the question of extreme, mm. which I felt like um, was sort of touched on. I mean, I've, I've just kind of glanced through the report, but I would love to hear a little bit more because um, the examples that, that, that you draw on, especially general strikes, <laughs> are a really critical tool in the toolkit for nonviolent resistors. Um, uh, so I'm thinking especially about uh, Senegal, uh, with, with, led by, by, by Yanomar, um, the, the strikes there, and as well as Burkina Faso. There are a couple of examples South Africa that come to mind, right, where the strikes have been pivotal in terms of bringing others on and, and, and sustaining the movements. Mm -hmm. So I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more on that and, and maybe push back that you need all the tools in the toolkit and taking out that one seems mm -hmm. like a bit, hmm, I would question that. <laughs> Thank you. Great. And the gentleman here in the, yes, in the blue. Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Roy Coleman. Uh, thank you for this amazing presentation. I look forward to reading the report. Uh, I was wondering if you have any remarks on the implications of this report for um, like mobilization in terms of resisting democratic backsliding um, or furthering democracy in partial democracies and how to do that without undermining the current democratic institutions. Okay, so I will ask uh, panelists to uh, kind of um, answer the questions and then bring kind of concluding thoughts and ideas. And, uh, and that will be, I will conclude our event. Uh, Jonathan, okay, so, maybe you can start. Yeah, so general strikes and democratic backsliding. Um, I completely agree uh, that general strikes are an important part of the nonviolent resistance toolkit. Uh, indeed, one of the, perhaps one of the most powerful tools uh, that a nonviolent resistance movement can employ. Uh, but I do also, you know, I think general strikes are kind of the nuclear option for nonviolent resistance, uh, particularly if you're talking about a perpetual indefinite general strike. And so it's a powerful, it's an extremely powerful tool, uh, but one to be used very cautiously, particularly when we're talking about uh, the context of a transition rather than a movement against a, against a dictatorship. So if you're fighting against a dictatorship uh, and there's sort of widespread buy-in for that, uh, then, you know, the max, like the sort of maximum force may be called for in that particular circumstance. But when you're talking about a transition, when the primary, when the primary things that people are fighting over uh, are, you know, what the specific institutional arrangements are going to be, temporary advantages of power, uh, then employing tool, employing uh, 
these extremely effective tools like general strikes uh, can be can be disruptive and lead to the and lead to an undermining of faith in the transition process. Um, so I would say it is an important tool, but it's just contextually uh, its its use is contextually defined. Um, and democratic backsliding. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts on the question. I don't know if I have thoughts that are that uh, are cogent. Um, I mean, I think in general, uh, I have a lot of faith in the potential of nonviolent resistance uh, to spur a sort of civic trust and to incur and to uh, bring people together to prevent. Uh, to prevent democratic backsliding, uh, I think there's there is uh, there is good data out there to support that. Um, that participation uh, in these kinds of movements is one way that uh, disparate sectors of society uh, can be brought together uh, through shared faith in a brighter future, uh, which I think is a, a very crucial factor uh, in preventing democratic backsliding. Um, but again, context really matters. The, the just, academics cop out. I'll, yeah. I'll just briefly flag a resource on the issue of mm. like ad addressing re uh, backsliding and how to uh, maintain mobilization in partial transitions and corruption. We've that has come up a lot in our conversation. So uh, Shaska Byerly, who's in the back, has written a really amazing book supported by ICNC called "Curtailing Corruption: People Power for Justice and Accountability," and it looks at specific campaigns and cases where people have mobilized to address corruption, which I think is just a perennial. Uh, a problem in backsliding and in not achieving full democratization. So I'll just leave it there. Read the report. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I think again, congratulations, Jonathan, for the monograph. It gives us a lot of uh, reflection uh, and points to reflect on, especially with what we're seeing actually here in the United States and outside. And it's like one of the important points that I like really struck me as I was reading that it was like very clear on the distinction between resistance and movement. And in a way, I think, I mean, it wasn't really spelt out, but there was like s sort of an understanding that they're not the same. Uh, because a lot of people look at peaceful protest as a movement, which is not. And it overburdens it with high expectations mm. um, that does not match actually the actual incident. And I, mm. think, I think your book gives us a lot of points to think and reflect on with mm. regards to this. And thank you. Thank you, Nancy, Melinda, Maria, Jonathan. Thank you, thank you so much thank for the excellent you. panel. And I would like to thank the audience for staying with us uh, till now. Uh, we've got the copy of the monograph outside for you to pick up, as well as you can download my monograph from ICNC website. Thank you again to everyone. Nancy, thank you so much. We need to talk a bit more about Tamara and the role of the team.